Welcome back. I'm your host, Kathleen Bates. And in our continuing conversation about tobacco use in the U.S. military, this episode features an inside look at its culture of using tobacco since the 1980s. Our guest for this episode is Al Lima, who recently retired from the Navy as an executive officer with over 30 years of service. My conversation with Al was eye-opening as he discussed how widely accepted tobacco use was in the 80s and 90s, during his basic training, and while on deployments. We then discussed when he started noticing a shift in the culture of using tobacco and his personal reflections on his own struggles with smoking. I really enjoyed speaking with Al, and so I hope you enjoyed my conversation with him, too. Okay, it is so great to have you here, Al. I am looking forward to our conversation today. Um, Before we get started, I know you were in the Navy, and you just recently retired. Congratulations. Thank you. And also, thank you so much for serving your country. We appreciate it very much. With 30 years, more than 30 years, a lot of experience um, being enlisted. And so I'd love to learn more about you. And I know our listeners would like to hear more about what you, what all you've done while you were enlisted. Okay. Um, thank you for, uh, inviting me here today. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my experience. I don't like to be put on the spotlight, but, um, you know, so I did about 35 years. I enlisted in 1986. I think it's key to talk about that from an enlisted aspect, because as you go into the questions you're going to ask me about, There is a little bit of a difference between officer enlisted. So um, 1986, a young guy right after uh, Top Gun, the movie was released at that that time frame, started to spur an interest in going to the military, went to boot camp and actually straddled that line where um, they they contemplated the idea of taking smoking out of boot camp. So pretty unique time. It was right at the end of 1986. And um, my actual job as an enlisted guy was a rescue swimmer. So if you think about the movie where people jump out of the helicopters and they request... Pararescue. Pararescue, but the Navy's version of it. Uh, Pararescue for the Air Force, they're actually special forces guys, trigger pullers, the uh, Navy rescue swimmers, they just pretty much rescue people that are down. Um, Pretty exciting. Two rescues, uh, two actual rescues to to my career um, off the coast of San Diego back in the late 80s. Pretty excited about that. Made a transition in about 88. Picked up a a school uh, job. Naval Academy is the school that accepted me four years there. Commissioned out of the Naval Academy in 92. And wanted to go back to aviation. Still pretty excited about, you know, the idea or the concept of being in the air. Also didn't really like the idea of being on an aircraft carrier because I'd already done that. And I picked the P3, which is just a big multi-engine aircraft. Mostly reconnaissance and search back in those days. Um, it, was, it was known for having a good radar, but it didn't really do anything else. It didn't go over land. Um, spent the first few years training a uh, couple deployments in uh, Japan. It was the beginning, kind of that desert storm time frame. Uh, our, like I said, our plane uh, wasn't allowed to go over land in about the first five, ten years I was in it. Early 2000s, we finally started uh, developing better cameras, better radars, and actually a, a much bigger role in the Afghanistans and Iraqs that would culminate uh, post 9-11. Um, 20-something years, I did a number of jobs, uh, tours in Coronado, California, attached to the CVN-74, John C. Stennis, uh, three, four tours in Hawaii, everything from P-3 tours to um, CTF-34, which is a, a water space management. We we control the water space of where submarines are, are allowed to go and not go. And that way we know if we see a submarine out there, if it's not ours or, a, right. or an ally, we know that it's someone else. Those were pretty early days. Um, the technology was, was still not as advanced as it was, so we could track submarines pretty far. Uh, but the U.S. submarines definitely led the, the, the assault on quieting materials, and it got to the point where you couldn't even track a submarine more than maybe a football field. So if, if you were farther away than about a football field, you started to not necessarily know where submarines were. Did a tour in Portugal. Uh, that was one of the big culminations. It was a joint tour. Um, the, the particular boss that I worked for was, you know, the, the if you think back to the times of, Benghazi's and, um, you know, the early generations of Syria and the, the, you know, activities that you'd see on the news, those were the kinds of things that I probably had sort of a role in. 
uh, came out of Portugal, came back to Texas, did a tour down in Corpus Christi. That tour, that started to sort of launch into my, what I would call upper level management type tours. That was the air opso down there. So I was the person that was in charge of four air bases. Basically, the culmination is all of the pilot training that was happening in Texas that was Navy related um, was sort of under, you know, my, the scope of what I could do. Um, runways, radars, lightings, communications, electricians, all of that, all of those people uh, would be people that worked for me. I'd say that was, at the time, I probably had maybe maybe a hundred direct personnel that I had to write uh, evaluations for, but probably a couple thousand people that worked for me. Wow. Uh, came out of that tour and went to Newport, Rhode Island. I was the executive officer of that particular base. Still somebody always that I would work for. Um, in that role, I, I probably still had about a 100 to 200 people that were direct um, evaluations that I that I was responsible for, and that particular base hosted about 20,000 people. So the you know the scope of what I would look at there would be everything from roads, electricity, housing, water. Um, really, if you could think of it as a mayor of someone like San Antonio or something like that, that's kind of the job scope that I had there. Um, 35 years total time, definitely enjoyed my, my uh, progress through the ranks. Gra- uh, finished, uh, uh, retired as an 05, a commander in the Navy, that would be a lieutenant colonel for Air Force or Army or something like that. That's quick. Uh, that's <laughs> quick, about as quick as I could go through it, but are there any questions about any of that back? Oh, yeah, I mean, um, I am, I'm floored by your background and what all you've been able to accomplish. Um, and reading over some of what you had done, at one point, your title was a military medical liaison. What is that? What does that position entail? So in Portugal, um, I was the United States Navy's national support element, OIC, or officer in charge. Um, So what that specifically meant was all of the U.S. forces that were stationed in Portugal, uh, generally there isn't a real U.S. base out there. So there's uh, four NATO commands, and we'd have members attached to those NATO commands. My job was to provide them housing, banks, telephones, um, medical opportunities, TRICARE, if you think you know, of the, the, the uh, military medicine that we have, but teach them how to get into the TRICARE network, but do it in Portugal. Actually go to a local clinic, actually go to a local hospital, um, provide them, you know, keep their medical records up to date, make sure they were getting their PFTs done or their you know, dental work done. So yeah. it, basically, uh, it was just one of the many hats that I would wear out there uh, responsible for all the service members that were stationed in Port- Portugal. At the time, I think we had about 500 people stationed throughout Portugal uh, across four NATO commands. Yeah, multiple hats is what it sounds like you wore at the same time. <laughs> Once you start getting into some of these management jobs, you don't really, you have a job or you have a title, but then you're kind of just sort of a... Um, Jack of Fill all trades. The, yeah, you yeah, do, you know, yeah. Somebody has to have sort of a lead and they would yeah. put a target on you. And that's, yeah. you know, you'd, you'd start providing those services. And it really started to get pretty ridiculous. We had a library out there. We had, you know, it was just an amount of services that the American personnel needed, but um, mm. you just wouldn't have had access to it. I think we actually brought Cirque du Soleil out to oh, Portugal. Wow. We did like a, we had a Pretty good MWR budget at the time. Considering MWR. The morale, warfare, mm-hmm. and morale, wel- welfare, and recreation. Yeah. In the Navy, it's sort of the social aspect. And actually, we're going to talk a little bit yeah. about MWR in a few minutes um, when, yeah. when you start to ask me specific questions yeah. about today's topic. We actually, the person that we spoke with, the expert we spoke with previously, he had brought up MWR and those types of things. So I am, I'm really looking forward to the conversation yeah. that we're going to have um, from when you first enlisted to how you, you know, went through the different ranks and how you were able to conclude on like a senior level executive from your perspective on those types of things. I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. Okay. But I actually kind of want to start way long ago before you even joined the military and learn more about you as a young man, as a kid growing up, you know, um, because the topic of conversation today is about tobacco use in the military. Mm -hmm. And so I am curious to know, you know, was tobacco a normal part of your childhood growing up? What what was what was that like for you as a kid? So I, I, uh, I was exposed to it. My mother smoked, but I, I don't remember it like 
I don't actually remember necessarily cigarettes in the house. Um, didn't stand out as a big memory item. But I do know that, so I, I was a partier, long hair, you know, typical kind of 80s kid, um, you know, keg parties. It's the same <laughs> stuff that's yeah, going today, on now. Yeah. Um, but I started having a lot of, I got a lot of tickets, you know, excessive speeding, driving on suspension. And I started to gravitate. For, I don't even, I can't even particularly tell you why I started to go into the military, but I think I saw that as a way that I was probably going to sort of survive those troubled years. And literally right before I went into the military is when I started smoking cigarettes. And it wasn't, it wasn't predominant use. It was probably this, you know, social. transition anxiety, social, definitely the, the people I was hanging out with were smoking. Um, so it was just sort of a natural transition. But I don't, I wouldn't consider myself a smoker really prior to going into the military. It was kind of like a, a habit around friends. Yeah. And th did you see that change once you did join? D de definitely. In fact, I remember um, I, we did, we were encouraged to actually bring cigarettes to boot camp with us. I, I didn't do it. And the first two, three weeks I was in boot camp was, they were still allowed to smoke cigarettes. And uh, I remember that the the base, you know, exchange or the PX or the BX, however you hear that uh, terminology, it's always in exchange. They had pretty significantly reduced prices on cigarettes. And I remember the, you know, the chief that was in charge of our boot camp class on that December 31st saying, um, <laughs> hey, if you, we're going to go smoke free tomorrow. So if you got them, smoke them. And so everybody literally bought cartons oh of cigarettes gosh. that night. And we, it was like just these, it was... A party for smoking? Well, and it was the only place you could take a break outside of whatever the training was. And if you didn't go out and smoke with everybody, then you kind of still were subject to whatever the rules and, you know, whatever training was going on. So you definitely saw those people out there smoking or just sort of sitting around talking and, you yeah. know, behaving normally. And I'm in here getting yelled at. So, yeah. yeah, even if you didn't smoke, you definitely started smoking then. So I remember the... We, we smoked outside. It wasn't inside the room. It was on like a stairwell. And I remember the first maybe week of boot camp, there being, you know, 10, 10, 15 people. And, you know, toward that, toward that cessation day where they were going to stop letting people smoke in boot camp, about 70 or 80 people would be out on the stairwell smoking. There's only 100 people in a company and there'd be 10, 12 companies, you know, in these buildings. So you'd, you'd all be out on the stairway talking with people above you and below you. It was, it was pretty ridiculous how much. The, the smoke stop smoking thing lasted about three or four days. <laughs> um, and then whoever was the rule maker for the Navy at the time uh, said, okay, we're going to let this class, this company is going to still be allowed to smoke. So everybody got wow. to go back and buy cigarettes again. And I, I finished boot camp as a smoker. Um, but people that were coming in after that day, I think they weren't allowed to smoke any longer. Wow. After December 31st, yeah. starting January 1, it was kind of just this yeah. weird, like yeah. you can smoke, but you can't but smoke. But you can't smoke. And so there were, there were groups that could still smoke, but there were people that were showing up after that date. And that would have been, uh, January 1st, 1987. I think that was the beginning of the, uh, no smoking in boot camp for the Navy, um, transition. How old were you when you finished boot camp? Should have been 19, maybe 19. That's so young. Yeah, <laughs> 1920. That kind of, this conversation is kind of along the lines of what I want to talk with, about with you next. And that's kind of just this culture of tobacco use and smoking in the military. When we talked with Dr. Dunnington in an earlier episode, he talked about a lot of just the, looking at the historical targeted marketing from the tobacco industry, what they did in World War One and World War II, and even before that, but really how they would design their ads to really target enlisted men. And then they would also target, you know, military wives and girlfriends and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so over the decades, <clears throat> that's obviously created this culture of acceptance in the military. And so it's you coming in, you telling me yeah. that you were encouraged to bring cigarettes with you to boot camp yeah. is blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. can't even I've never heard of that. No. Yeah. And, and the incentive and the prices were ridiculous. If you had friends or family that couldn't get on base and they knew you had access to go on base. I mean, you get a carton, an entire carton for like a dollar. I, I know there's like wow. 20 packs or something in a carton. Yeah. So the, the incentives and the ability to buy tobacco and alcohol on yeah. base were pretty pretty ridiculous back in those times. Yeah. 
And then even with while you're in your uh, basic training, you have this shift in policy, but it's not really consistent and not everybody is held to it. It sounds like such an interesting culture. And I, I would love to know how that culture progressed from when you first entered and then from when you retired a few years ago. There was a definite transition. I don't think it happened in the early 90s. I think that we were still, even though maybe there was this idea that you couldn't smoke in boot camp, I think that was about the only time that there was any sort of active anti-smoking campaign. It was literally that, you know, like 30 30 weeks or maybe it's only like uh, eight or 10 weeks of boot camp. That was the only time in the military that you couldn't smoke. After that, all your other trainings, everywhere you were stationed, they even still had ashtrays in the airplanes. They had, you could smoke inside the ships. You could smoke, you know, anywhere. So I, I would say that it was not discouraged anywhere except for that boot camp training process. Do you know why that was? I, there was a concept. I think I wouldn't go so far as to say it was a concept, but like you mentioned from the doctor's previous statement in the 50s and 60s, um, tobacco industry figured out we were a pretty good lucrative market, not only because we were young, you know, bucking the system, volunteers, all, all those good concepts, but we were also worldwide and we were going to have disposable income and we were going to probably carry these habits on, you yeah. know, post-military. So pretty easy market to infiltrate. Um, we were probably, I think we we're probably about 40, 50 percent smokers coming through the the end of the world war they actually issued cigarettes in our little mre packets that they were called c rations yeah and that uh, was that be in the 80s yeah 80s and 90s when you were still getting about the end of the 70s is when they started taking them out of there but that they were literally actually guaranteed to be part of what you we would get on deployment you know if you were out there you weren't even buying it when you were on deployment in the early 70s you didn't need to because you you would be getting they were given to you and then uh coming through the 90s uh, it was still too lucrative of a market, I think, in the base exchanges or the PXs, how, whichever terminology people prefer. Um, alcohol and tobacco were were so highly discounted that you just there was no incentive not to do it. Yeah, and, and I imagine there wasn't a lot to do depending on where you were stationed too. Yeah, and I don't I don't think we left the bases a lot. Most of us were still young. We didn't have our own cars. You didn't have cell phones. I mean, think about it. There, yeah. We didn't even have cell phones. You weren't playing video games on your phone. So what were you kind of doing? You were you were meeting up with people who also had cigarettes. You couldn't drink during the duty day, but you could smoke. So everybody would go outside and have a smoke break. You could have that little altered sense of reality. And then um, for sure, after work, everybody was, you, there was still a lot of encouragement. There were still on-base bars. So even through the early 90s, late 90s, you'd get off work and you'd go to the on-base bar, whether it was a junior enlisted, senior enlisted, or officer bar, and pretty much have a few beers after work every day. I, the, even the marriage mentality wasn't real high. I think even if you were married, if you were on deployment, it wasn't, you know, the things that went on deployment was kind of like the, the Vegas atmosphere. Right, what happens in Vegas stays yeah. in Vegas, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so it, I think in the 90s, there started to be a pretty definite transition away from it as they started taking it, uh, the incentives away from the base exchanges. They, definitely the prices, you started to see them go up. I don't think there's a lot of data until about 2010 when we started literally defining every building on base. There was no smoking in buildings on bases. Um, all the smoking on ships had been taken away, smoking on aircraft. Even people were still trying to dip and, and use uh, you know, snuff tobacco. Um, even that was starting to be kind of frowned upon. You couldn't, mm-hmm. They wouldn't walk around with bottles and, and spit everywhere. And uh, it was probably... 2010, 2015, they even started pushing the smoking areas farther away from doors, farther away from air conditioned inlets. Yeah. It got to the point somewhere around 2015 that it was so hard to be a smoker. Um, I, I don't. I think that was also the transition to vape pens, probably about that time frame. You know, yeah. pr- you know about that time frame because um, a, a smoker just was encountering so much trouble smoking. Um, they had to, they basically had to do it at home in their own house or they just weren't really doing it at work. Um, you see a lot a big reduction in the amount of people that would be out at the smoke pits and 
Uh, you, we couldn't spend money on smoke pits from a base perspective up until about 2015. If you were in a hot area like this, you could build, you know, uh, gazebos and whatnot for people to go out and smoke in. If you were in cold areas where it snowed, you could build gazebos. You could spend money on things like that. That funding for all of that started to go away in about 2015. Um, so that that's about the biggest decline in our smoking probably was sometime after about 2015 where it was too hard to smoke. Mm -hmm. The base couldn't spend any money on smoking and um, there just wasn't any incentive to do it. So yeah. I think most of the smokers had to either hide it with a vape pen or just quit, do it when they maybe. were quit maybe. Yeah, yeah, find the most opportune times. Yeah. So for you as a smoker, did you feel like there were some challenges or did you feel, I'm sure there was a lot of pushback and so I mean, at that point in time frame, I imagine you were probably in those upper level management and you saw the good and the benefit of it. But also as somebody who used tobacco yourself, was that a bit of a struggle? How did you feel about all of those changes? So it was weird. I actually quit while I was still enlisted right before I went to the academy. So it was a it was a successful uh, quit campaign for me in about 88. And um, I, I don't I can I actually didn't necessarily seek out to quit. Uh, at the time, I was smoking uh, menthol cigarettes, Newports, pretty mm -hmm. huge marketing push, Newports mm -hmm. in the military at the time. And uh, for some reason, either I had been sick or something, I'd gone three or four days without smoking. I had a pack of cigarettes that were, you know, in the, I'd lived in the barracks. I was still at that age where you couldn't move off base. I wasn't married. And when I picked the cigarette back up, I think it was already stale. If you can if you're a smoker, you kind of understand what that term means. Like a stale cigarette just doesn't taste the same. And, um, and so it didn't taste right. And so I went like a few more days without smoking it and it didn't taste right again. And so somehow I quit and it wasn't intentional. I didn't, I didn't seek out to do it. Probably didn't want to spend the money. I mean, it started to cost a little bit more. And then, uh, first few years in the military as an officer, it just wasn't that typical. It wasn't typically an officer thing to smoke, except on deployment and especially in combat environment deployments. You know, if you were in a pretty easy place where you could go do maybe recreational activities, there didn't seem to be quite as many smokers. But uh, as these deployments started to happen in more like Iraq's and Afghanistan's, you know, Muscat, Dubai, it, the, in those environments, I think you were kind of pinned down. You couldn't really go off base. You couldn't really do anything. You could still buy tobacco on base. And so I, in the office world, I'd say there was a huge transition to cigars. Maybe it was this concept that you weren't smoking, but, I mean, y you were. I mean, it was still a tobacco product. But I just don't, I can't recall thinking back to a bunch of my friends, you know, being out there smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Um, so as those rules started to come on, I was a non-smoker. Even though I smoked on deployment, I didn't consider, I mean, I would send in home boxes of cigars. Like I certainly wasn't buying Cuban cigars because they were, <laughs> they were on a, I don't remember the name of that list. It was a, an item you weren't allowed to have. Yeah. But yeah certainly I would bring home <laughs> 20 <laughs> boxes of wow. Cuban cigars. They were so, so many cigars that I would, couldn't even give them away to people. Still didn't consider myself a smoker. So as these kind of rules and regulations started to ramp up, I didn't feel like they were targeting me. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like I was part of it. I didn't feel like my friends were smokers. Um, and then post-2015, when I started really being in some of these more management positions, and I could start to sort of count how many people were away from their workstations and how long they were work, you know, away for smoke, pit, smoke breaks, that's probably when I started to realize there was definitely a time impact on allowing people to smoke. I, don't, I still don't think I understood that there was a health impact. I think I was still sort of of the mindset that it was how much time are the employees spending away from their workstation. Um, I don't think I was keeping track of how many days they were sick. I wasn't keeping track of, you know, how, you know what kind of medicines they needed or what kind of cessation. Mm -hmm. we, we, weren't, we really weren't targeting people as smokers. I don't think we were at the management level, but certainly at the regulation level they were. They were pushing the ability to smoke just just off the base, out of the buildings, and off the ships. 
Yeah, I know. We in the previous episode we had talked about there was specific legislation that had passed where smoking was no longer allowed on Navy ships and even submarines. I think for yeah. a time had smoking yeah. and they realized that was probably a very yeah. bad idea. Yeah. And uh, you couldn't even sell tobacco products on Navy ships anymore. Yeah. And even I mean today with e-cigarettes, they've also banned that because of some issues with e-cigarettes blowing up totally. on ships. Yeah. Yeah, and the Navy had some weird laws. They were actually, I think the Air Force was sort of the leader in trying to go anti-tobacco uh, promotions, anti-tobacco. Uh, when I talked a minute ago about the MWR, so the, the base exchange is the one entity on base that sort of operates outside the military. It's not, it's, it's kind of a, it's a civilian market and they are um, allowed to, you know, price their products at whatever price they want in order to try to make a profit. Uh, some of it comes back through this morale, welfare, and recreation department. So whenever you see these stores, a portion of what they sell uh, goes back to the base. You see it on uh, Lake, Lake Travis. There's a there's a place up there that people can go do recreation activities. Um, you just don't see it quite as visually now that the profit from tobacco and alcohol has gone away. But um, that that is the only uh, company that's allowed to market on base and sell things. And I don't just mean tobacco and alcohol. I mean, they can sell clothing. They can sell just about everything. It, mm -hmm. it was probably... Food. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that... But that's the only sort of civilian network on the base that's allowed to interact with military people. If you think of it yeah. as a as a company, they're definitely not a military company. They're They're a civilian organization and they're just allowed to have a... Uh, place on base to sell things. Most of those places have taken um, all of the profit away from the alcohol and the cigarettes, tobacco. They they still do sell them, but I just it's just not as like, like it might be like one tiny little you know small area. Yeah, yeah. It, it used to be a whole row could have been uh, developed to that. And the places that some of the bases I go around here. I still see a, a little row dedicated to alcohol, but you just don't see the big... Uh, it's yeah. not even as much cigarettes on, in a base store as you might see at a gas station. If you think about that back wall of a gas yeah. station being sort of a cigarette wall. Um, so it's less than that. Yeah, less yeah. than that now. Yeah. Pretty pretty major decline in uh, tobacco sales and alcohol is still there, but yeah. that probably won't go away. Probably not. <laughs> Um, so some of what you were talking about, it kind of reminded me of a conversation that we were having earlier, uh, the different types of advertisements and whatnot that you would see in magazines and things like that. And so I was curious, you had said the Air Force is the branch, I think the only branch that has gone pretty much 100% smoke free. They don't do anything at all. But Marines or Navy or anybody else is there, have you seen to this day or even back in the 80s and 90s, what was that targeted marketing like in magazines and whatnot? <coughs> I didn't. I didn't realize we were being targeted as 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 I was living through it. It was just um, so. The biggest thing I could compare is, you know, there's this one publication called the Times, the Navy Times, and then there's an Army Times and an Air Force Times and a Marine Corps Times. So depending on what base you're on, it seems that it's one company that's able to do it. When I say the Air Force is uh, as a as a branch, uh, they quit putting tobacco promotions you know or advertising in that kind of document so or if they're gonna if they're gonna put their name on something they're definitely not smoke free uh, probably probably all the militaries are about the same you, I think I've read some studies where they you know at one point in time they'll say one branch has a lot more smokers than others and I think it would probably come down to more of the age group and and or education level and or deployment status. So um, it, it really, I don't, I don't realize I was being targeted, but yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd flip through a couple pages and you'd see the marble man or you'd see the, you know, the camel or you'd see, you know, a big Newport advertisement or something that you'd see it in the magazines. You didn't even realize it was, but you know, particularly directed at you. Designed for you. I didn't even think it was that effective. Cause I mean, if I wasn't that opening a, you know, a, a newspaper or something didn't make me suddenly think, oh, you know what? I need to go buy a pack of smokes right now. I either was a smoker and I knew I needed a pack of smokes or, but you know, at that point in time, I wasn't really a smoker. So I just would kind of blow yeah. through those advertisements. 
Yeah. I definitely, now that I think back, uh, and I can kind of put it all in a chronological order, like you talked through the 50s and 60s, where it was just almost given to them. Then in the 70s, 80s, they started kind of taking it away. 90s and 2000s, they started taking it off base. So I, I would, would probably have a little bit higher smoke rate across all the militaries than a civilian. But I also think we're we're probably that age group, I mean, 18 to 25, 18 yeah. to 29. You know, most of these people are, you know, looking looking for something to do. Or like you said, incredibly stressful situations. If you're in the combat area or on active duty in another part of the world or things of that nature. And so I think about, I know that they took them out of the rations, but um, I mean, I'm sure loved ones would still ship tobacco products to their, their, their loved ones that are in the military and things like that. And I know, I mean, I know I have heard stories from veterans where they would get something in their um, MRE, right? That's the proper terminology. It's something they didn't like. So they would trade like, Oh, I don't like this peanut butter thing. Can I have that chocolate thing? So was that kind of the same concept, even with tobacco products, would you trade things of that type of nature? I think, I think that did happen for a period of time. Um, Especially, I hate to say that it's like a combat deployment. I don't mean it that it's only those deployments. I think you're just not doing anything. You know, like you're you're either going and you're out on some sort of a mission, or you're kind of sitting around in tents, or you know you're waiting for something to happen. And so you and you just you can't drink during a duty day. So it was it wasn't um, it wasn't illegal to have a cigarette. And so yeah. that was kind of the only way you could probably alter your reality a tiny bit. Pass during, your time. During a work day. Yeah, just something yeah. to do. 15, 20 minutes, you're all standing around. You'd go out and you'd have a smoke break. And yeah, I would say um, if you were the person who had somebody sending you some through the mail, um, then you had some sort of a, a collateral. You had some leverage. Kind of, yeah, you had some leverage <laughs> that you might be able to, you know, trade it for some food or trade yeah. it for something that you wanted. Most of the places we are we aren't hurting for our own supplies. You know, like even in Iraqs and Afghanistans, we always had a base exchange. We always had the ability, I mean, even to buy civilian clothes, even in places like Iraq and Afghanistan was not, was not hard on base. Um, so if you were, if you were asking family members to send that to you, um, either they were probably paying more out in town for it, or you, you were probably a pretty hardcore smoker, Mm -hmm. Because it was available on base, you could yeah. you could always get it in those places. You just had an abundance of free time when you're on deployment, and no friends and family other than the, yeah. the particular people that you're stationed with. And the off chance that you were able to leave base and go into town, I always think, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, hookah is a really big part of their culture and what how they see themselves as a social thing. And so I am curious for someone who spent some time over in those countries and you ventured off base, did you ever see their culture somehow integrating into your culture uh, or the, the, cult, the, the culture of tobacco use on base or within the military community? <clears throat> I saw that question on, on, as I was uh, coming over here today. That, and I really tried to remember the impact that hookahs had. Uh, what was funny is that we actually still sold hookahs on in military places in Afghanistan and Iraq, even toward about 2014, 15, even though hookahs weren't allowed, uh, you couldn't own one as a military member. You were, you, it was somehow, it's considered a, a, a pipe. Yeah, it's a yeah. paraphernalia. We're not allowed to have it. And yet people would still bring them off deployment. And it always kind of weirded me yeah. out. But, okay, so specifically in Afghanistan, I was um, privileged enough to leave the base in a, in a more, in a, in a, not in a civilian aspect, but in a liaison, local liaison aspect. And uh, A, they did seem to smoke more heavily even than, than our service members. And it was a lot of cigarettes. Hookahs were uh, culturally acceptable after meals and stuff like that. So it happened to, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like the opium dims of, you know, China. And it, it was just kind of like, it was there. Yeah. But I do remember coming back from deployments and people would bring their hookah pipes back and they'd have parties at their houses and 
even though we kind of knew it, it wasn't allowed and they were yeah. and they were smoking flavored tobaccos and so um, it was it was kind of an okay thing even though it was at the same time it wasn't I mean it yeah. was it was clearly illegal we weren't supposed to have them um, certainly if you lived on base you know uh, there's a type of housing that's still considered on base uh, most people a lot of people live out in town on their own in their own houses you could have just whatever you wanted in your own house but if you lived on base you weren't supposed to have them and I remember being at people's houses who would have parties that would sort of revolve around the hookah pipe and throwing pillows on the ground and it was like sure this isn't what we're supposed to be doing <laughs> it just felt wrong like you know it felt wrong on, yeah. on too many levels but yeah um, it was still seemed okay and there were and it was even you know they were selling them through some military outlets when we were over on deployment so it seemed like it was being encouraged but it was discouraged at the same time so yeah. it was very clear uh, let's say clearly mixed signal yeah yeah i have heard about that myself uh, there's a few people that i know that are you know yeah. have um you know, retired or former yeah. veterans or are veterans and um, they have hookahs and they talk about all of that. And like, they think that okay. it's yeah, allowed. But if you really, you know, drill down on the regulations, it's not it's not yeah. allowed for active duty military people. So. Yeah. A lot of the research has shown that that um, your chances of using some type of tobacco product when you enter into the military just go up yeah. whether or not you had ever used it before. Yeah. I think for a variety of reasons, I think if you go overseas, obviously just experiencing different cultures, because mm -hmm. if you're stationed in another country, you're there for a few years and you start to pick up habits yeah. from that culture that you're that you're in. Yeah. But then also even just stressful situations, depending on where you're at, I imagine that does follow you home. I mean, even like what you said, hookahs, they brought hookahs back yeah. and it followed them home. Yeah. Yeah. And clearly people still think they're OK, you know, to have and, and like you've you've talked about people that have acknowledged it or had it around you. And I, and I know for sure, because I've, it's one of those things you'll Google, you can Google <laughs> everything now yeah. and uh, you would Google it and you'd find the rule or regulation that said it wasn't allowed. And people would almost still call your bluff and, and say, no, it's not allowed. Or they would say it is allowed. And you're just kind of telling them that it's not. So in addition to when you're overseas and maybe you bring a little bit of culture back with you, even whether you didn't or you, didn't bring a little bit of that culture back. Just being in the military alone is a stressful situation. And so there's been a lot of research that has been conducted about the fact that enlisted men and women are just more likely to use tobacco because it is stressful situations. And so I was curious from your perspective over the years, what you've seen, but also um, just kind of having the opportunity to make decisions at higher level, higher levels than others, kind of what your thoughts are around the fact that so many struggle with um, PTSD or any other kind of um, mental health concerns regarding the stressful situations that they encounter and using tobacco kind of as a coping mechanism is that you see that you saw that while you were there and you see it now as a veteran. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's like an interesting question to me because I think when you are a part of it, you don't think you're a part of it. So um, when I smoked, I didn't think I was smoking because of pressures. I just thought I liked it. And so if I watch other people, um, I, I couldn't, t I, don't, I don't know what they're feeling, but, you know, coming, coming through full cycle and thinking about PTSD and the things we use as coping mechanisms, it would be hard to not acknowledge it because it is this little altered sense of reality you're looking for. I believe, I, you know, that's why we have a beer. That's why we have a glass of wine. You want that little that intoxicated feeling and a cigarette can do that for you. I, I think even full, you know, seasoned smokers are probably still getting a little bit of a buzz from a cigarette. Otherwise it's gotta be a lot more than just putting something in your hand. It's more than just that physical habit. So I, I think I would have to agree that there is some coping mechanism, but when it's you, you just don't realize it. I'm, I'm sure everybody wishes it away by saying, I like it. I like the way it tastes. I like the way it feels. I like to do it. But you, you know, deep down, I can remember the, you know, even as a cigar smoker, the smell on your hands, the smell on your clothes, or when you get around a person that's smoking, but you're a non-smoker, you can, you know, definitely smell it on their clothes. You can smell it in their hair. So I can't imagine that um, a person would willingly continue to take all those negatives, you know, increased health risks, you know, additional costs, you know, supporting the habit of smoking, 
if they weren't getting some sort of a coping mechanism yeah. from I just didn't think as a smoker that I was coping. I just thought I liked it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it does. But it also makes me think back to, um, you know, if there's no realization, maybe there isn't any awareness or education. Mm -hmm. Was there ever any kind of awareness or preventative mes uh, messaging? I mean, anything, anything along those lines that you've seen over the years, especially when they started taking, because you said at some point in the 90s and the thousands, they, they try to do a better job of taking some stuff away, mm -hmm. passing smoke free um, areas and things like that. Did they ever implement any kind of preventative measures or maybe even quitting measures to help people? It's it's there if you know it. But you have to but, know that but it's there. But you have there. to know that it's there. So now when you do a physical, especially if you're in a job that needs a yearly physical, everybody needs some, everybody has to get some type of a physical every year. The, the job may be a more stringent physical, like if people in aviation have a full-blown flight physical. And as you're wrapping up that meeting with the doctor, they're going to go through these questionnaires. And they started doing this probably in about, I'm really guessing, probably as old as about 2010. Suddenly these questionnaires would come up and they'd be like, do you get enough sleep every day? Do you have a healthy diet? Do you eat fruit, you know, four times a day? How many glasses of alcohol do you drink? You know, how often? How much cigarette, you know, or tobacco use do you have? How often? But at the time, we, we, we're still very much a culture of, um, I would say, even though this was very visible to people that when you're out of the smoke pit, we certainly wouldn't admit to having a drink every day on this questionnaire, and we certainly wouldn't admit to having a cigarette every day on this questionnaire. So, so I would imagine that, you know, even from a flight physical standpoint, you know, I was checking those boxes like, yeah, I'm doing good. I, I I drink socially once a week, you know, and, and when I drink, it's only one one beer, maybe two. <laughs> um, so so even there, it's there. Yeah. We, we certainly weren't hearing it. It certainly didn't ring as something yeah. that was important. Nobody ever beat their foot, you know, and told you, hey, you know, you're going to miss an extra week's worth of work this year if you're a smoker. Hey, you're going to you know, you're more likely to die yeah. by this age. And even if they told you that, you were young and bulletproof, so you, you certainly didn't particularly care. It was, you're not talking about me. You yeah, know, I'm, I'm not invincible. Be, you still have that mentality at that literally. age. Literally. Yeah. And it was encouraged to be invincible. I mean, up until, I don't even think people started to admit to things like PTSD until like the, the last five to 10 years. I mean, it was, yeah. you, you didn't... Uh, you didn't want to go to medical. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the people that were above you didn't want you to go to medical. Um, you Why? could go have a smoke break. I don't know. It was really counterintuitive because yeah. um, it just wasn't, I don't know, maybe badges of honor. It was like a you want Because you because they want them to be so physically fit and able to get the job done at the drop of a hat yeah. and this and that. And you would think that using tobacco is totally counterintuitive yeah. with what they want you to be able to do and perform at your highest level yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. And I know the military reviews, you know, as owning your body, you are the property yeah. of the U.S. Yeah. military. So it is so interesting to me that they wouldn't have had more, um, I don't know, thought process in yeah. it or provided more preventative measures or even just support for yeah. quitting. Yeah, we really didn't. I don't I don't think it was um, universally a concern. You know, I don't think anybody sat down and crunched numbers on what it cost or you know, now you see it. Now you see in all right. these studies they do how now. much it costs. And now, so now they're pushing it even harder. But, you know, you said um, physical fit. So I'm going to go back to uh, just a, not kind of a quick story. So when I was at my my most seasoned smoking time frame was in the school of rescue swimmers. So it's a pretty tough school. It's, a you know, the whole first like five, six hours of the day is just running, exercise, push-ups, PT. And I was still smoking easily a couple packs a day. And wow. yeah, it was like, it was like I'd wake up and smoke. I'd get to work and we'd have like a uniform inspection and I'd smoke and then we'd get into PT gear and we'd run and, and they'd give us, you know, after about an hour of running us, they'd let us smoke. So even, even at the time when I was most, um, the most physically demanding part of my military time was also the most smoking I'd ever done. Yeah. And I can just remember like, uh, you know, as I started to quit smoking, coughing up, you know, yep. just whatever was in there and, yeah. and putting so much damage into my lungs. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I think 
we just think we're pretty much bulletproof. We don't we don't think it's going to happen to us. We yeah. just get to move through it. That the advertising isn't directed yeah. at us. The non smoking yeah. advertising isn't directed at us. It's There's a no, part of that mentality that um, military mentality that nothing's going to kill you, nothing's yeah. going to harm you. Yeah. So hey, smoke a carton, hey, yeah. why not? Literally, because you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine. You can wake up the next day, and and it's also, I mean, it was hand in hand with alcohol. When it, you know, through the same period of time that you're talking about all of the, you know, relaxed tobacco problems, we had all the relaxed alcohol problems. And it wasn't until the last, you know, five, 10 years that we've sort of cracked down on that too. Yeah. It's pretty hard to survive a career with alcohol as a problem in your life. And you could probably still survive with tobacco as a problem in your life because mm-hmm. you could just do it at home at night and still go to work the next day. No big deal. Yeah. So with all of the experiences that you've been talking about and what you've seen, how you've seen things progress over the years and whatnot, do you do you think that the military is in a good place with the different type of preventative strategies and quitting strategies they've implemented? Or do you think they should be doing more? Um, until you asked me, you know, as a part of this, I probably thought we were ahead of the curve just because I, I think there's a lot of things we, we do ahead of the civilian world. We, we take even though we have these crazy sexual assault numbers, I believe that's because we're overly vocal about those problems. Um, so every problem that kind of seems like it's spiked in the military, I usually think we're on kind of on the leading, you know, edge of doing better than, you know, the civilian world at large because we're sort of opening it up. We're, we're kind of opening that wound and we're letting everybody look at it. You see it in the news, it becomes hyper-focused. Um, so until you actually asked me, I probably thought we were doing better than the civilian world at large in terms of, you know, smoking and smoking secession. But put that question to me, we're probably not doing enough. I don't know exactly what we could do better because it's there. I mean, every time you get a physical, somebody's going to ask you questions about it. But you also said that they might not actually tell the truth. Yeah, I just, I don't think we've made that. I don't think the average service member has bridged that gap of, you know what, I'm going to openly talk about this. I'm going to openly, it's in, I'm encouraged to admit to it. I'm encouraged to get help. Something I've been curious about while we've been talking, because it sounds like there are measures in place if they're caught drinking, especially if you're under the age of 21, if you're caught drinking and there are some, you know, repercussions of your actions and whatnot, but, you know, they raise the age of tobacco use from 18 to 21. And so I was curious if you ever encountered any of those issues or if you've heard about anything now that you're retired, how do you, because if there are measures in place for reprimanding somebody who's been drinking under the age, what about using tobacco products under the age? Yeah. So the, you're venturing into the thing, the UCMJ uniform code of military justice. It's just the, it's the tool that the, the management or the boss or the skipper or the commanding officer has um, to punish any of the enlisted in the command as well as the officers. There's a different process. Um, officers go to court martial and enlisted can can just get a captain's mask, just, you know, something within the command. Um, going back to the Newport tour, uh, one of the things I had to do every day was tour the barracks at some point in time during the day. And I'd, I'd pivot that around sometimes during the day, sometimes at night. Had to do a certain amount of room inspections. Um, and I do recall going into rooms where you could tell that they were underage and they had alcohol or underage and they had tobacco. And, you know, we, we would literally call them from work if, you know, if, if I was in a room and it was readily apparent that they're underage and they have this, these uh, things out. We'd call them back to their room and we'd, we'd discuss it with them. And generally, if they weren't my own sailors, we would turn them over to their command. We definitely had um, the means by which to, to, if you want to use the term punish, for something as simple as that kind of infraction, it wouldn't be that severe. I don't, what I consider not severe is something like a month's worth of pay or a half a month's worth of pay for like a month or two. It's, it's a pretty minor punishment, but it does stay on their record for that grading cycle. So we certainly have the tools and to the person that we're doing it to, it probably feels super major. Imagine yeah. losing half your pay yeah. for a month or two. It yeah. would be pretty dramatic at that income level. 
But um, but to the people in you know doling out those measures, you know I think we're doing it prudently and probably not. We don't think we're punishing the people that hard. But I imagine when you're living on a pretty tight budget, it, yeah. it's got to hurt pretty bad. Yeah. I don't know if that means they're taking it right and they're you know they're not generally walking away from these types of punishment saying, oh yeah, somebody just taught me a good lesson. I'm gonna <laughs> quit doing that. I, I don't yeah. think I don't think that you're in that age group somewhere between 18 and 25 that you particularly, you're still, you're yeah. still kind of anti-establishment, even though you're in the military, yeah. you're kind of still anti-establishment. Yeah. Even though, yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like that might be an opportunity. If it already isn't an opportunity that's been capitalized on, it might be an opportunity to insert some awareness yeah. classes or something like yeah. that. So, but, um, so the next couple of questions that I have, I kind of want to transition to just you being a veteran. And so now that you've been out of the military for a couple of years and you've had the opportunity to reflect like what you've been saying and you're now a veteran and I'm sure you have plenty of friends who are veterans and whatnot, thinking on your time and as a veteran, so resources, I think it's really important that there are plenty of resources, whether it be for active duty or not, but have you seen or have you seen a lack of resources available for those who are trying to quit or those who are struggling, like how we talked about earlier, coping mechanisms, and they want to quit and they want to be able to work through some of the issues that they're experiencing? Have you seen that work out well? Have you seen a gap in providing resources and support? So there's there's a few distinct different groups of military slash pets, you know, post-military. So um, a person who completes 20 years and is entitled to a retirement is entitled to TRICARE for life. And they pay a very small premium for that. And TRICARE will provide tobacco cessation. You know, they'll even actually give you like nicotine gum and stuff at the, at the, uh, you know, the clinics and stuff. So if you retire, if you fully retire from the military, you have a wealth of resources just in TRICARE alone. Um, recently retired, suddenly there's this really big switch from I've never been a sick day in my life to, oh, my gosh, I got all these aches and pains <laughs> and I'm going to get every single thing that's wrong with me accounted for because there's, a, there's a, a second group that takes care of military pretty well, and that's the Veterans Administration. So within the Veterans Administration, though, sometime in the military you had to admit to the problems you've had some some type of problems whether it's um you know injured knees or feet or or ptsd anxiety all you know the the list is pretty extensive and it even includes burn pit areas things places like iraqs and afghanistan's now as long as you get some percentage of a disability then you have pretty good access to Veterans Administration medical and or dental benefits at, at, at you don't pay for them. So as long as you get 10 percent disability, you're going to be able to get um, appointments on uh, VA hospitals. And there's a ton of VA hospitals in Texas throughout the country. Um, VA healthcare has really improved over about the last decade or two. At once upon a time, I think it was just like a, a, a very sore subject within um, the, the VA was just how bad the care was. I think it's pretty top-notch right now. It, it competes real well with my TRICARE. This third group of military people are people that don't complete a 20-year uh, a retirement, so they're not entitled to TRICARE, and they don't get some kind of a medical retirement, so they're not entitled to TRICARE, and they don't have a VA disability, so they're not entitled to VA. That group ba basically walks out of the military with nothing. So... Yeah. That's got to be, I don't know how big that group is, comparatively speaking. I know um, we don't have a lot of people that make the 20-year retirement, and we don't have a lot of people that make the 100% VA disability retirement. So this group of people that are left out in the cold is probably pretty big, and they, don't, they definitely don't have anything open to them um, for free or at highly discounted rates. Um, I was just going to say that it's just been so great talking to you. I have really enjoyed listening to your experiences and learning more about you when you enlisted and what life was like then for you. It's a treat for me. So I really want to thank you so much. I think it's been a treat for those who are listening. And so my last question is for, 
for you is kind of a very, very much reflective. And I know we've kind of been reflecting on a, this whole entire conversation has been reflective, but um, if you could do, if you could do things over, would you have done things differently when you first enlisted and you were a smoker? And then also what kind of advice would you give to enlisting men and women with trying to find healthier ways to cope than, you know, using tobacco? Yeah. You know, I don't particularly have regrets in life, and that, that's more like a standing policy. And one of the things I'd like to provide to your listeners is more of a discussion. Um, I seem to be health-free from the impact of smoking. Uh, probably did, uh, I'd say, was a pretty serious user for about four or five years in the uh, 16 to 21, 22-year realm, and then uh, pretty pretty heavy cigar use on deployment and then really heavy cigar use the last few years of military. Um, I don't seem to have any health effects from that. And so I don't have any, you know, financial impacts from that. So it's real easy for me to walk away and say, I don't have regrets related to smoking. What I'd hate to do is leave your, your uh, listeners with the idea that, um, oh, you know what, anybody that smokes can just stop smoking and then they're going to live a happy ever afterlife. I'd, I'd rather actually reach into the, your mind and say, um, it's, it's something you should take serious now, wherever you are in your life, whether you're in that 18 to 25 year old group or 25 to 35 year old group, wherever you are now, stopping smoking today will give you a greater chance at a longer, healthier life, regardless of who you are and how much you do it. There's, there's just no, there's so much evidence that there's long-term commitments, um, I, I use the term that I won't know what those impacts are until our, until I'm more like 80. Uh, every time I smoked a cigarette, there is one thing that I did understand is there's some amount of life that you're wiping off the end of your life with every cigarette you smoke. Let's call it a day. Okay. So for every cigarette I smoked, I wiped a day off of my life on, on that old lifetime. So if you're, 80s or 90s, or you're hoping to live into your 80s or 90s, you're either going to do it with emphysema and all kinds of conditions and have just the lowest quality of life in your 80s or 90s that you could ever imagine for every amount of years that you smoked, or you could stop smoking now and maybe live pretty healthily into that uh, 80, 90 year old time frame. Very few, hopefully very few uh, conditions that are caused by tobacco use. You, you might have some other things you have to overcome like cholesterol or PTSD or anxiety, all those other, yeah. you know, items that we've been discussing. But imagine the, the years that you're trying to protect are those ones in your 80s. You're not, you're not worried about it in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s because you're still pretty healthy and you're, you're walking around and driving and working. In your 80s, imagine if you're on a ventilator and your whole day is connect, connected to oxygen and that's, that's literally the life you live. You can't go outside your house because you're carting a, you know, a barrel full of oxygen around behind you. Whatever those years, however old you think you want to live, you're going to live a much better life in those years if you stop today. If you don't stop today, those last 10, 20, 30 years are going to be significantly more complicated. I think it's hard for people to think long term like that, especially like you said, no matter 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, because you are happy and active and healthy yeah. and loving life and living life, hopefully, hopefully yep. right? Um, it's hard to see that far into the future. But so far, I myself completely understand what you're saying, because I just recently lost my last grandmother and she was a smoker since she was like 12 years old. And so for me, I grew up around that my entire life and I knew I just don't want to subject myself to that because... Yeah that doesn't look like a quality of life I'd want to live. And so I think, I think, I think that that your commentary, I really think will resonate with people, whether or not they've had a family member go through that. And so they know exactly what we're talking about or not. And they decided to pick up the habit. I think hopefully they can take the moment to visualize themselves in 40, 50, 60 years from now, however long to yeah. be 80, 90 years old and to try to envision the type of quality of life that they want. Yeah. And if they are using tobacco to really, really consider yeah. quitting. I didn't realize until you asked me here, you know, how much of a problem smoking and um, alcohol use and drug use could be. And I kind of had to, had to look at it myself and think, yeah, you know what? I was pretty out of control for that five, five, 10 years of my life. Um, so I, I hope that that's what I could have a, a takeaway. One or two people heard yeah. that 
and thought, well, you know what? Maybe I'll stop. I'll stop for a week. Yeah. See how it goes. Uh, get through that cough up your lungs yeah. stage and get to the other side of it. And then it might be a, a little bit, a little easier to wake up every day. Yeah. I think the topic of conversation, I mean, I'm so happy that we had this conversation with you and in the first episode with Dr. Dunnington, because it, it, it's a, bi- a very big spotlight on, I, I think, a problem and you yourself said, didn't realize it was an issue and it really is an issue. And yeah. so I'm glad we're having this conversation. I feel like now as the market of tobacco products changes and it's just the concentration level gets higher and higher. And as the tobacco industry invests more in marijuana products, we really do have a significant, another different significant issue on hand. And so hopefully the topic of conversation can continue and it can start to go down that path of we might need to take a look at how we can actually really help address some of these concerns as men and women are enlisting yeah. into the military because they might already be severely addicted to nicotine. Yeah. And if you can't have your vape while you're in basic training, I can't even imagine what those weeks would be like. Yeah, I, 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 we, I, we experienced it for like three or four days and it was, it was so daunting that the Navy, you know, let you do it. it. Yeah. yeah, they let us do it. So, yeah, I couldn't imagine now being a heavy smoker or vapor and then and uh, trying to quit cold turkey for that yeah. amount of time. There's got to be I, there's got to be a lot of people that are struggling that are still yeah. doing it or struggling, you know, that would probably benefit from doing it before they before they went in. But yeah, it's hindsight's 2020. Yeah. You know, a lot easier to look back on our life and say, well, I wish I didn't do yeah. that. Or I wish I could tell people and actually impact them when they were young. Well, but you are now even still right now through this conversation. And so you'll still be able to impact people. Hopefully a few. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really genuinely appreciate speaking with you. Awesome. It really has been a pleasure. Cool. I really, really have enjoyed speaking with you. I, I appreciate it. I, I know I talk a lot, but I uh, the opportunity to speak openly. Uh, I, I don't think I'm going to want to hear myself. So I don't know if I'll listen to it <laughs> right. myself. And I'm the least, same way. At least for the next month or two. Um, but I do appreciate yeah. you guys letting me take the time and come out today. And I hope I uh, taught a few people something. Yes, absolutely. I think no matter who is listening, they will have learned something from you. So I thank you again. Good. So thanks. Cool.